Welcome back. In today's lesson, we'll talk about two applications of thermal radiation. In the first simulation example, we're going to model the baking of a cake in an oven. The cake is baked due to the radiative heat transfer from the heating coil and the convective heat transfer inside the oven. We'll use simulation to explore the temperature distribution in the oven and the cake when both modes of heat transfer come into play. We'll also show how temperature changes if only radiation is modeled. In the first step, we created a geometry of an oven and a cake. The oven consists of a glass door, but we are treating the glass door as an opaque body from the standpoint of radiation. And these parts have shared topology, which means they share nodes at common faces or edges, and no thermal contact is needed. A steady state thermal analysis is used to see the temperature distribution after a long period of time. Now for materials, many sample materials are available in ANSYS engineering database, and we'll just pick from there. For the cake material that's not available, we'll assume a thermal conductivity of 0.3 watts per meter per degree Celsius. Now after assigning the material to the geometry, we'll need to discretize the domain by meshing it. And since radiation is a nonlinear problem, for this example, we'll use a relatively coarse mesh to make the simulation run faster. But a finer mesh is used for the coil because we want to capture the curvature of the CAD geometry properly. Next, the boundary conditions used can be categorized into two types, convection and radiation. First, let's apply convection to the outer faces of the oven and glass door, except the faces where the oven rests on the ground. And this convection represents the ambient conditions existing around the oven. The ambient temperature is set to 22 degrees Celsius. Next, let's apply convection on all inner surfaces of the oven, including the inner face of the glass door. And this models the circulation of hot air inside the oven due to the fan. The bulk temperature is assumed to be 180 degrees Celsius. However, by defining the bulk temperature inside the oven, we are specifying what the temperature should be as a priori. But doing so may end up providing unrealistically uniform heating and artificially adding or removing energy to the oven. So to avoid these drawbacks, we use a script or a command object to remove the ambient temperature constraint on the inner convection boundary condition and leave it undefined. Then the solver will calculate the ambient temperature for us that satisfies thermal equilibrium. So in summary, a better way of modeling convection inside the oven is leaving the ambient temperature undefined rather than imposing the temperature as a known value. After defining convection, let's apply radiation. Define radiation on all the inner surface of the oven and inner surface of the glass door. And this radiation type is surface to surface, and we are expecting these inner surfaces to form a perfect enclosure. And the massivity value of 0.5 is assumed. The view factors between each element participating in radiation will be calculated by the solver. And let's define the source of the heat. An internal heat generation is applied to the coil, which represent the heat source. Now with all the information defined, we can run the simulation and look at the results. Let's first do a temperature contour plot on all the parts and have a sectional view of the result. It shows the highest temperature on the coil and relatively uniform temperature distribution inside the oven. The reason for this uniform temperature distribution is the application of convection load. Apart from temperature, we can also plot the total heat flux for the oven. Since heat flux is a vector, we can turn on the vector plot to get a better idea of the heat flow direction. For regions like the cake top surface, the vector arrows are pointing normal to the surface, and it indicates that the heat transfer is going into the cake. The heat generation rate is the internal heat generation multiplied by the volume of the coil. Notice that the meshed volume may be slightly different from the CAD geometry volume if there are curved surfaces meshed coarsely. This is due to the fact that the mesh is faceted geometry, so a coarse mesh may not capture curvature well. The solver does not see the CAD geometry but only the mesh, so it's important that the mesh capture the important geometry details sufficiently. Multiplying the meshed volume and the internal heat generation, we get a value of 1582 watts, which is the same as the heat dissipated by the outer convection. The radiation and the internal convection does not add or remove heat to the oven. We can also use a command object to obtain the ambient temperature inside the oven. 
The value we obtained is 182.7 degrees Celsius. And this means that if we directly impose the ambient temperature of 180 degrees Celsius, we would obtain an inaccurate result. Now let's do an experiment and remove the convection load on the inner surfaces and run the simulation again. Now we can see the dominance of radiation. The temperature on the top of the cake nearest to the heating coil is hot. The effects of the view factors can also be observed clearly. In another simulation example, we're going to model the campfire radiation. When sitting around the campfire, you can feel the heat from the burning wood. The heat transfer is not conduction because air is a very bad heat conductor. It's not for convection neither, as hot air mainly goes up instead of moving laterally. Thus, the only heat conduction mode left is radiation, and that's what we're going to simulate in this example. We'll use simulation to explore the temperature distribution on a human body when he or she sits around a campfire. And we'll also explore how that temperature changes as he or she moves closer or further from the campfire. The first step of simulating campfire radiation is to create the geometry. First, we spend some time creating this human geometry. It's a person in a seated position on the ground. Then we use a cylinder to represent the burning wood. Notice that although the flames can be very high, we neglect it from the geometry and only leave the wood. This is because the flame is the gaseous part of the fire, so it's in essence gas, which has a negligible emissivity. And the main heat transfer mode of the flame should be convection. And that's also why when we want to heat something up quickly using fire, we want to put that object above the heat instead of next to it. Another consideration is to include all the major objects that participate in radiation. With that in mind, we also created a big block to represent the ground. The wood and the ground have a shared topology, and thermal contact is only needed for the interface between the human and the ground. Perfect thermal contact is assumed. Now after we attach the geometry, we can assign materials to the geometric parts. In this example, we are examining steady state temperatures, so only the thermal conductivity is needed for the materials. Here is an illustration of the material properties we used. The boundary conditions used can be categorized into three types, fixed boundary condition, convection, and radiation. First, a fixed boundary condition is applied to the wood body as 600 degrees Celsius, and the bottom surface of the ground as 15 degrees Celsius. For convection, natural air flow is applied to the surface of the person, wood, and the top surface of the ground. A film coefficient of 20 watts per meter square Celsius is used to represent natural air flow and the ambient temperature is set to 15 degrees Celsius. It's important here now to apply convection to the bottom surface of the wood block and the ground area it covers, because in reality, these areas won't have much air flow. For radiation, the emissivity is assumed to be 0.9 for the person and the ground, and 1 for the burning wood. The surface of the person, wood, and the top surface of the ground are included for radiation calculation. Again, we'll exclude the bottom surface of the wood and the ground area the wood covers from radiation calculations. Now we have all the boundary conditions defined, but to solve the simulation, we still need to discretize the problem by meshing it. A small tip we used here is to assign a small element size to the person, wood, and the ground close to them, so that the mesh captures curvatures and provides higher numerical accuracy. Then for the larger area of the ground that's far from the person, we use a coarse mesh to keep the computational time down. A solver will calculate the view factors between each element, and then calculate the radiation based on the equation we learned in the previous lesson. Now with all the information defined, we can run the simulation and look at the results. Let's first do a temperature contour plot on all the parts. We can see that the burning wood has an imposed temperature of 600 degrees Celsius, while the ground the wood sits on also has a higher temperature. But other than that, we cannot get too much information out of this plot, because the burning wood temperature is so high that all other parts appear as blue in this plot. So let's plot the temperature on the person only. This time, the contour plot provides useful details, and we can see a higher temperature on the person's face, chest, legs, and feet, as these parts are directly facing the campfire. The higher temperature is around 40 degrees Celsius, while the lower temperature is close to the ambient temperature as 15 degrees Celsius.
We know that human is a constant temperature animal, which means the body temperature remains constant around 36 degrees Celsius. So if you want to make the model more realistic, you can dive into details and model the core and the skin of the human separately and apply a constant temperature to the core. But the purpose of this simulation is to illustrate the idea of radiation, so we won't dive that deep into modeling the person. Apart from temperature, we can also plot the total heat flux on the person. Since heat flux is a vector, like what we did before, we can turn on the vector plot and get a better idea of the heat flow direction. For the regions like the chest, where the vector arrow is pointing inside the solid body and cannot be seen, we can plot the heat flux on the surface only. And through this plot, it's obvious that heat flux is going into the human body. Another useful output we can get is the radiation probe on the person. It provides us four components. Outgoing net radiation, emitted radiation, reflected radiation, and total received radiation. And we can do a quick calculation here and find out that the total received radiation rate is higher than the reflected plus emitted radiation rate. And the remaining radiation heat flow rate is, uh, is 128 watts, which equals the negative of the outgoing net radiation. Now let's do an experiment. Let's move the person half meter closer to the campfire and run the simulation again. Now the highest temperature increases to 123 degrees Celsius. We can run another simulation and move the person half a meter away from the campfire compared to the original simulation and plot the temperature distribution on the person again. And this time, the highest temperature drops to 30 degrees Celsius. The change in the result are due to the change in the view factors. The closer a person sees to the fire, the larger the overall view factor is and the more radiation he receives.